Vampires have inspired our imagination through books, films, television, and games. Along the way, they have changed and mutated from the foul monsters of folklore and early fiction to the dangerous but sexy figures of paranormal romance. Vampires hold one of the greatest fascinations for us, more so than any other creature of myth. This panel will trace the vampire's history, explore all of their many variations, and examine their enduring appeal. Um, I'm now going to turn over to my panel to introduce themselves, starting with Gareth. Hey, uh, thanks for inviting me in. Uh, I'm Gareth Hanrahan. I'm a uh, primarily a role-playing, a uh, role playing writer and game designer, um, although also write fantasy novels. My major field of vampire expertise or vampire experience was writing a campaign called the Dracula Dossier for the Netsplications role-playing game, which so we wrote the Dracula novel as a after-action spy report by British Intelligence, so their attempt to recruit Dracula and how it all went horribly wrong. And yeah, that was a large chunk of like, about two years reading nothing but Dracula over and over again. And that's me. It was fun. Cool. Thanks, Gareth. Welcome. Um, Kat. Um, I'm Kat Dodd. I am a writer. Um, I got introduced to vampires through Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, you can tell which generation I'm from. And I uh, got involved with Buffy fan fiction. Um, I was actually, I read all of the Twilight books. I know, like, error. but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, so, so most of the vampires I know are more of the modern vampires. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. I'm sure we'll have fun. And Kim. Hi, I'm uh, Kim Newman. I'm a novelist and critic. Um, I, I have a long-standing relationship with uh, the vampire subgenre in, in general and uh, Dracula in particular. My life was changed by um, watching the Bela Lugosi version of Dracula when I was 11, uh, 50 years ago, uh, next month. And... Um, I wrote a, a novel called Anno Dracula, um, and in fact, that's turned into a series, which is not just about Dracula, but it's kind of about the, the whole idea of, of vampire culture. And, uh, and I mean, it's literally a vampire novel in that it bites other novels and drains the life out of it. Um, uh, and so as a result of that, uh, I'm quite well up on um, vampires. Also, if you follow me on Twitter, I, uh, I tweet your daily Dracula. Um, which uh, is uh, images from uh, Dracula movies and TV shows, um, famous and incredibly, incredibly obscure. Oh, awesome. That is wonderful. Um, well, that kind of ties in very nicely to my first question. Um, I know you've all mentioned Dracula, or some of you mentioned Dracula and Buffy as well, but um, what was your... Other than that, was there another introduction to vampires? Was it novels or, like me, Count Dracula, or was it something else? I think for me, certainly the first, like, like vampire novel I recall reading was Dracula. I remember reading it around age 12 or something and find it confusing because the first epistolary, uh, um, how everyone pronounces novel done with letters, epistolary. That one. Epistolary. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm being sort of confused by that. But I mean, like, you, you, I think vampires are so sort of like, you know, culturally omnipresent. You, you, like, you, like, you, the kids, like, learn about vampires, like, you, as toddlers, like, you know, it's a, um, it's a terrible Netflix series, isn't there? About, like, you know, a vampire preschool, which my, my, my two boys were watching for years. Um, I don't know a recent one, but I do remember Mona the Vampire. She was a little cartoon vampire who went off to school every day and caused mayhem. Um, was there any other kind of early influences on other than Dracula or Buffy? They're mostly derived from Dracula, aren't they? I, mean, I, 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 I was trying to work out what other sort of images of vampirism that I'd seen, uh, in my case, before 1970. And they all turn out to be Dracula. It's like Dracula was on Doctor Who in the 60s for one episode and he turned out to be a robot. But, hey, you know, Dracula met the Daleks once um, and and actually he did it again recently in the Lego Batman movie. Um, 
But the other the other image of of vampires then was Grandpa Munster on the Munsters. <laughs> yeah. Um, shows that kind of at some point in the 1960s, maybe during the the kind of the monster kid boom, the great rediscovery of mm -hmm. universal horror movies and hammer films, monsters had become rather domesticated. They'd become sitcom characters. That was the era of you know Count Chocula serial and all that that kind of stuff. And the 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 blitz of vampire popular culture outside of movies. I mean, movies, vampire movies were still quite intense and serious well into the 1970s, um, although there were one or two spoofs. But everything else, all the other ephemera uh, about it was was sort of rather cute and sweet and tidy. I th and I think it was probably in the mid-70s when um, Anne Rice's interview with the vampire and Stephen King's Salem's Lot came out almost back to back um, yeah, you know, I think you'll find that in in all the years between Dracula's publication in 1897 and those mm -hmm. two books in the 70s, fewer vampire novels were published than were published in any given month now. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it was quite a sparse field, but it mushroom growth after that. It's to the point when people who were doing bibliographies just gave up. <laughs> you know, it used to be quite easy to compile a bibliography of vampire novels. Um, I don't think anybody's tried it recently. I'm sure no. there's some online database. However, it's too late. The the bat is out of the bag. There's too much stuff. Uh, yeah, even I can't keep up with it. And kind of, it's my job. <laughs> wow. Kat, any um, any other thoughts from you? I, I was trying to think of like what exactly was my very, very first introduction because like I started watching, I saw the Buffy movie um, before the show came out, obviously. <laughs> um, so that came out in 92, which means I would have been six. So you yeah, picked we that started watching it early. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so but even that before that, yeah. sorry? You picked that over Gary Oldman the same year. I, my dad sat me down to watch it because he loved it. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and somebody, then he was really excited when the show started. So, um, <laughs> Someone has to be a Christy Swanson completist. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, so I don't really remember before that what, what would I have looked at of how would I have found out about vampires. I just remember pretty much always knowing at least a little bit about vampires. Well, so since we've been talking about Dracula, um, he's had many Im Im imitations and um, adaptations over the years, but many believe that Leslie Nielsen in Dracula Dead and Loving It is actually the closest interpretation of the original Dracula. How do we feel about that? Um, let's start with you, Kim. I wouldn't put Leslie Nielsen in my top 10 comedy Draculas, let alone Dracula. I mean, I, I'm a huge Mel Brooks fan. And in fact, I think there are one or two really good performances in that film. Leslie Nielsen's is not one of them. Um, I think he's a, he was a very gifted deadpan comedian. But when he's tried to be a funny comedian, he was actually terrible. Um, certainly George Hamilton in Love at First Bite is way better as a comedy Dracula. because. He also has just that little bit of poignance as well. There's that, that great moment where he sort of sat there sad. And he says, how would you like to spend 800 years dressed like a head waiter? Uh, <laughs> whereas Leslie Nielsen does the farting bat jokes, you know. Um, yeah. Gareth, any thoughts from you? No, I'm, I'm trying to work out if I have this sort of like, you know, a, a favourite cinematic tra Dracula, or even a favourite comedic cinematic Dracula. I mean, my instinct goes to um, what to do in the shadows, which gives you like you know four like you know, four different versions of Dracula right there. Catch any I actually have to give you guys a confession. I have never read Dracula. I know wow. this is sacrilege. I've read so many things around Dracula, but I never actually read Dracula itself. <laughs> So I, I I feel kind of unqualified to weigh in on who is the best Dracula. Yeah. I remember a, 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 an expert in vampire literature once saying to me, "Was this? I mean, 
if you're going to walk the talk, you've got to read the screed. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I've read Dracula. I've also read like Varney the Vampire, which is like over a thousand pages. <laughs> wow. Um, right. So, um, what are we counting as vampires? Are we looking at just the undead blood sucking? Sorry, the blood sucking undead humanoids, or does the car from Joe Hill's Nosferatu, for example, count? And what are the minimum requirements to be counted as a vampire? Let's start with you, Kat. <laughs> yeah, you start with me. Um, I uh, actually do tend to count a lot of things as vampires, but I also like divide things up into subdivisions on are these closer to the classical vampires? Are these like vampire lights, etc.? I have weird hierarchies for a lot of things. Um, so for me, the main thing that makes something an actual vampire is the undead, is the blood sucking. Um, and then from that, you have the 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 closer to the the historical literature and then you have the more excuse me the more modern takes of maybe they don't need blood but it's where they get most of their stuff or you go get into the machines and, and that kind of thing which is like even further into the vampire light cool gareth um i think it's really you, you sort of say between like vampire-ish and vampire like you know Anything that sort of like sustains itself by draining like human vitality is going to sort of behave in a vampire-like mm -hmm. fashion. So like you know, like mm -hmm. the soul vampires of Star Trek, or oh my God, like succubi and so forth, they're sort of like vampire-ish kind of. And then you've got like you know the like you know, the, you're like you know uh, Eastern European gentleman with with the color and the fangs. But even there, you've got a huge range of like you know different quirks of behaviors like you know um well like you know, dracula is sort of like it gives you your sort of baseline vampire the even the modern perception of vampires does different from that like you know, dracula in the novel happily walks around in sunlight wearing a straw hat at one point um whereas like you know the sort of the common perception of vampire would be like him going poof in the sunlight so yeah i think basically my sort of like you know baseline vampire is that which feeds off other people and drains them mm -hmm. um, and like the historical, or like you know, the sort of mythological vampire was a lot less like you know, sexy and cool. It was just like sort of bloated, like sort of human walking tick, mm. like blood pouring out every out every pore and so forth, which is far less appealing. And Kim, yourself? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it, in my feeling as Dracula is such a sort of dominant form in vampire literature and and film and, and and media but vampires define themselves by how like or how unlike dracula they are yeah uh, even joe hill's car has dracula's license plate you know um, it's yeah. not it, it's really hard to do a, a vampire story that doesn't acknowledge dracula in some way as a, a, I suppose, a market leader or a style guru or a brand leader. Of that. Um, yeah, even, I suppose, female vampires tend to um, derive maybe from Carmilla, but probably more from Dracula's Brides or Lucy in, in Dracula. So even that, you know, is there. And and you, ha you have the, you know, the people who... who I, I think that although there... You know, there's a well-established tradition of vampires who, you know, drain life or make people older or tired as uh, psychic vampires rather mm. than drink blood. I think somehow drinking blood is kind of important. I think it's the it's the 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 seal of of what makes a, a vampire. I also, you know, um, what what makes vampires interesting in a dramatic sense is they're the monsters you can have a conversation with. Yeah, you can't sit down and have dinner. You can't have interview with a werewolf, right? Yeah, because he'd eat your tape recorder, you know, and then you, you'd never get anything out of them. Um, and, and actually the, the Frankenstein monster is very chatty, um, but all, in the novel at least, but he's also kind of self-involved. Vampires have this thing of, you know, being able to pass in human society, even um, 
Nosferatu, who looks like a stick insect or a rat, somehow seems to think he can walk around the city. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so therefore, there is there's, there are potential for dramatic interactions with other characters that you don't get with most monsters. Uh, most monsters rampage, you know, and, and vampires rampage a bit. Uh, but they can also talk to you. They can also have complicated relationships with each other or with human beings or with, uh, you know, with their food, um, mm. which, again, most monsters don't have. I think that's why the, the vampire subgenre has been so enormously um, popular and prolific uh, over the ages. It's just there's more you can do with it. That's That's definitely true, isn't it? Um, so it's interesting, though, that, I mean, Vacula, Dracula wasn't considered, or certainly wasn't the first vampire novel, but why, what is it about it and why has it become the touchstone? Why has he become the kind of iconic vampire that everyone aspires to be? Um, Gareth? Um, I, th- I mean, I, I would swear to this, I, I, I think you at one point, it would have been a little shot my head, but it's been a while since I've done the research. Um, I think it, it, it sort of—it was a very popular novel. It was a, did a, a stage adaptation as well, and it, it sort of happened. I think around the time, or the, the, the first movies they were based on. I think it was the movies that really sort of solidified it as sort of the default vampire. Um, I very much default to him on this, though, because he's a bit much better idea than I do. Yeah, I gotta say, it kind of was the first vampire novel. Um, in that Varney the Vampire is a penny dreadful, so it's a long serial. Um, and there are a few other things, but somehow it's the one that that coalesces the the idea of the vampire into a novel piece. There are lots of short stories. Carmilla is a novella, um, it's actually part of a longer work. Um mm-hmm. And there are there are, uh, uh, there are people out there who say uh, so it's the first vampire novel in English. Um, there, yeah, there's, I, I just read um, there last week Paul Bell's um, yeah. Vampire City, and there are a few other uh, uh, things from around the world. You, you, and and thing is, if you read a you know most pre Dracula vampire sort of fictions, you can see that they're they're not quite there yet. And I do think that yeah. that you're right. It was the play. And then the films. If if um, Dracula hadn't been adapted, we'd remember it about as much as we remember Richard Marsh's The Beetle, which came out the same year and was a bigger hit. That was the horror novel everybody bought in 1897. And I think it is still in print. And it's a fascinating book if you ever read it. But it has no cultural footprint at all. Mm. Um, and, and you know why I think Dracula was the one that clicked. It's a really stupid thing. It's the name. Um, in the, the first draft of the novel, he's called Count Vampire, which is <laughs> terrible. But he struck it out. Um, yeah, but Bram Stoker found this um, historical name um, and, and just thought, that I'll have that. And that's it. I think Dracula is... is it sounds good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good villain name. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, in the way in the Hammer films, where the, the music score is timed, you know, Dracula. You know, um, and I think that that really did click. That was the thing that, that made it was a memorable name. Um, whereas there had been, there was a little craze of um, vampire fiction earlier in the 19th century spun off from uh, Dr. Polidori's The Vampire, which is a short story, but that was turned into a play. It was even kind of uh, ripped off and imitated and parodied in and became operas and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And, and Lord Riven, the vampire from that, was the default vampire before Dracula. But again, he's disappeared into, into the uh, the cultural ether. Um, actually, yeah. I, I revive him in my books because I think he's a really interesting character but he he faded from popular consciousness you know probably it was the case that Dracula came along and eclipsed him and Mm. much or some of the the public image of Dracula the Bela Lugosi image of Dracula derives as much from 
Polidori's vampire who can go to dinner parties uh, and hang around with people, as from Bram Stoker's, who can't. Yeah. Interesting. Any thoughts on that, Kat? Um, yeah, honestly, I do, I'd very much agree with pretty much all of that. Um, I, I think, oh, golly, I had a thought. Sorry. I literally just had it, and I was trying to hold on to it. Oh, no. This is life with ADHD. <laughs> um, Dracula, Dracula, Dracula. Right. Um, I think that one of the reasons that, that vampires and, and why Dracula came along at a very good time, especially for, for turning into a movies and that kind of thing, is for most of the other monsters, you have to have all kinds of special makeup or special mm-hmm. effects. But with vampires they still look human to an extent. So you don't need the same effects. Mm. You don't need the the same makeup. And that's actually part of why we latch onto it because like who might be a vampire in our own lives walking down the street? What if that's a vampire? Like that, that kind of thing. So there's always that what if scenario in our head, even if like logically we can look at things, there's still that emotional aspect of it of you never know. Very true. Very Which true. is probably answering a different question than the one you asked. <laughs> no. Um, but almost every culture seems to have some kind of um, vampire legend. But most of the origins are also completely different. Um, does anyone have a favorite origin myth or perhaps the most unusual one that they came that they've come across? And yes, Kat, this question was written especially for you. So yeah. I'll start with you. Um I, I actually pointed out to, to the team that uh, the, the Greek origin myths of vampires are the ones that make me laugh the most because there are two that I love. And the, the two are if a cat jumps over a grave seven times, that will result in a vampire. And the other one is if you eat a sheep that was killed by a wolf, you will become a, become a vampire. Oh. Um. Okay. <laughs> they are, yeah, they are weird. They are so weird. It's, it's literally not connected to a vampire turning you into a vampire at all, um, which makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Gareth? Um, there's so many. I mean, the uh, book research there, Vampire City, which is this weird French novel from the middle of the century, has vampires with clockwork hearts. And the main vampire that gets a vampire diploma in the post, as far as I can tell. Turn to a vampire. And this is like a, a legit sort of serious horror novel. Um, I played a lot of Vampire the Masquerade when I was younger, which is the role-playing game, where vampires are descended from Cain, who was turned to vampire by God as punishment, which always struck me as a rather sort of like, you know, slap on the wrist. Oh, you want to be like, you know, immortal and like all the superpowers. Take that. Certainly different. And Kim, any thoughts? Um, I think I'm a traditionalist. I just like the, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cursed by God. I think that's fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that does seem to come up a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Cursed by yeah. God. <laughs> um, so the depiction of vampires, the depiction of mythology of vampires has changed a lot since the first novels featuring them. Are they still creatures of horror, or do we do we view their differences as part of being an all-inclusive society, as seen in recent Twitter feeds and um, Facebook threads? So, um, Kim, any thoughts? Um, one of the things I've tried to do in my own work is is remind you know, or or try to deal with the fact that vampires are still supposed to be scary. I think because there, are, there is so much vampire fiction around, sometimes the, uh, the fact that it's actually a really creepy, unpleasant idea gets lost. So I've tried to put that back. But also I've um, been writing this series in which there are, you know, there's a sizable population of vampires. So I'm sort of interested in the notion that there'd be some vampires, even other vampires, would have a problem with. Um, and I think for me, it's it's um, Count Orlok, Nosferatu. That's the one. It's like Dracula would not want to be in a room with Nosferatu. Yeah. Um, it, there's a sense that you can get so far in, in 
you know, integrating with human society and learning polite manners and dressing well. But there's this guy in the room, yeah, who basically uh, is really stretching the notion of, of what it is to be a part of human society and is still kind of existentially terrifying. Um, I like it. It's something that you don't often see in vampire movies anymore, but you see in early vampire movies. The idea that, um, you know, when they walk past, flowers die, you know, that kind of stuff, that yeah. just being around them um, is a bad thing. You know, the whole thing of Nosferatu bringing the plague with him when he, he comes to um, Bremen. I, I think that that idea is still valid and still interesting. The idea that, um, you know, when a vampire moves into your, your district, he's not the only thing you have to worry about. Um, Gareth? Yeah, I mean, it sort of calls back to the point there about vampire being monsters you can talk to. Like, if it's a monster you can talk to, then is it a monster that you can, like, you know, um, like, you know, sort of live alongside? And depending on, like, you know, what your particular take of vampires is, maybe maybe that's true. Maybe there is a way for, like, you know, humans and vampires to coexist peacefully and they're just misunderstood and, like, you can, they can, like, you know, feed off animals or synthetic blood or they find some cure. Or you can like, go the other way and find no, that like, you know, the vampires are just like inherently monstrous, that they're predators and we're prey, and like never the twain shall meet. And or you can like you know, have all sorts of interesting bits in, in the middle where like you know some vampires are tolerable, others are not. Cool. Cat. Um, so I tend to come up with like just my own headcanons around various things. Uh, and vampires is one of the things that I probably have developed a lot of headcanon around because it's fun. And I've never really enjoyed the idea of an entire species or race or anything just automatically being evil. I I find the shades of gray of things a lot more interesting than the blacks and whites. And so the idea that like a lot of vampires fall into the evil category because it's easy for them. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. But then you also have the, the vampires that will be fighting against that and uh, fall, falling clo more into the shades of gray. Um, maybe they're tied less loosely to their morals than humans, but also humans as a whole can kind of suck sometimes. So it's not like that's a high bar. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have also, like, like I said, I grew up on Buffy, and then from Buffy, I, I moved into paranormal romance, and you cannot get into paranormal romance without getting into vampire romance, <laughs> and it's really hard to get into vampire romance if all vampires are automatically evil. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Um, okay, so following on from that, um, do you have a piece of vampire lore that you like or dislike, um, for example, being sparkly, hating garlic, um, needing grave dust to survive or move around, or um, turning into a batch. Um, let's start with you, Kim. I kind of like all of those things. I think they're, they're, if they if they work for the story, they work. I think it's uh, it, it is a pick and mix. You don't have to have every single one. Yeah, I know that. Before me, <laughs> most people who sat down and wrote vampire novels had to do this thing of making a list of traits and then ticking off the ones they wanted to use and excluding the ones they decided, you know, it's like Anne Rice said, that no, you can't turn into a mist and go through a keyhole, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I, and, and I thought, well, no, I want all of those. So I'll just have lots of different vampires who could do all that stuff. So I'm happy with, um, yeah, I like the turning into mist, although that... It kind of makes a nonsense of you being able to drive stakes through them. And, and uh, there are all kinds of other things that are utterly contradictory, but also wonderful and magical and strange. Uh, there is a sort of difficult thing about the, the whole not casting reflection in mirrors um, thing, which it's really hard to make sense if you're trying to write one of those sort of rationalized, medically credible, science fictional sort of vampires things. But I kind of wanted it because it's such a great image. Mm. Um, I'm not even sure if, if you know, not having a reflection means all kinds of things. It's like, you know, what, 
what would somebody who doesn't have a shadow actually look like? Would that mean they wouldn't have shadows on their faces? Couldn't you like not see their noses? Um, <laughs> you know, all that, that sort of stuff. And, but if it works, it works. If it's if it's worth playing with, um, I'm I'm happy with it. Yeah. Same with I don't know fangs. <laughs> yeah. Gareth, any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think ever since being Dracula, what's really sort of like, you know, intrigued me is that the restrictions on vampires, like the cancerous running waters, have to sleep on native soil sort of thing, and how they get around that. I mean, like, as a novel, the Dracula spends a vast amount of his time dealing with, like, you know, property law and like, box smuggling, which is like, fascinating. It's like, you know, you've got, like, you have a vampire going, ah, that's scary enough. But it's the, it's the logistics around vampire life movement and feeding and just transporting them and so forth. That, that gets really sort of interesting and intriguing for me, in a way. I so mean, one like of the... With restrictions. And the whole, like, you know, being invited in thing, that's another yeah. aspect, like, you know, creatures you can talk to. Like, how, how does the vampire trick his way into your house? Yeah, that was one of those things that seemed stupid for a very long time until um, John Linkfist wrote Let the Right One In and made a whole novel about that premise, and it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do think that one of the um, the issues modern readers have with Dracula is it's really hard to care whether an estate agent dies or not. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Um, Kat, any thoughts yourself? Um, I actually don't hate the vampire snorkel, sparkle thing um, because inside the, its own lore, it's consistent, which to me is is the bigger thing of is it internally consistent? And she didn't say if vampires go out in the sun, they'll burn up. All she said was they don't go out in the sun. They can't go out in the sun. And inside Twilight itself, they can't go out in the sun in front of people. They are not allowed. That is a hard and fast rule. And if they do that, they will be killed by the, the ruling vampires. Uh, so I don't hate it because to me, that's like an interesting twist. Um, I, I like a lot of the, the, the lore and things. And it's interesting to me how much of the vampire rules come from fey mythology. Can't cross running water. If you spill something, they have to count all the grains of sand, all the grains of rice. Um, if, if you throw salt over your shoulder, they have to count it. Um, have you ever tried to count salt? It's near impossible. Um, but that's, again, the, 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 the ring of salt is um, with dealing with demons and with fey. Like, a lot of it comes down from fey. Um, I was thinking of a thing. Where did you go? Silver. Um, the, the the can't see yourself in, in the mirror. It's because vampires had a weakness to silver. Mirrors were made out of silver. They don't show up in photography because to develop the photographs before we had digital photography, you used silver nitrate, I think, but I am not a chemistry person in the processing process. Um, so if you like, if you look at the individual thing, you might be going, oh, this doesn't make sense. But if you look at it as the whole of it, it's like, oh, okay then. Um, so yeah, I think that you can kind of pick and choose the lore to use and you can pick and choose to use all of it or whatever. And the solution might be to have different kinds of vampires and different, different families have different roles and maybe it's psychosomatic and maybe it's like actual roles that come into play. Uh, it's just all interesting. <laughs> oh, that leads nicely into a question from our audience. Um, who's your favorite vampire and or vampire slayer? Um, let's start with you. I, I am very aware that I'm focusing more on modern things, um, and, and young adult and that kind of thing. Um, Rachel Kane wrote The Morganville Vampires, and I love Rachel Kane and read all of her books because I met her and she was lovely. And the fastest way to make me like you as an author is to make you make me like you as a person. Uh, so I read all of her book books on the basis of she was nice to me. And then I kept reading them because they're enjoyable books. Uh, so my favorite vampire is actually Myron, Myrnin. I'm not actually sure how, how to pronounce it. Um, because he's so wonderfully not human. Cool. 
but I love him and I just want to cuddle him and I want to promise him that it'll be okay even though he's very not human and would probably kill me if I tried to do that. Cool. And um, Gareth. Um, I'm trying to think of what my favorite vampire would be. Um, I'm quite, I, I, other than going for the obvious one. Um, yeah, you know, on Devs Island Disc, you have the Bible and Shakespeare, and yeah. then you pick your favourite book. It's true, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can say, you know, Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee are off the table. Sure. Um, in that case, my favourite, possibly favourite member then is um, Joseph Kerwin from H.P. Lovecraft's The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, who's not like in the vampire, who isn't really a character vampire in that he's brought back from the dead as opposed to being undead. But he's like, he's described as drinking blood and he's this like sort of spooky 17th century necromancer who possesses his, or replaces, in fact, his descendant. In terms of slayers, I am going to steal from Dracula and go for uh, Quincy Morris, who's the most ridiculous character in the book, this like sort of random Texan um, who sort of pops up and shoots wildly at things and then heroically dies by stabbing Dracula with a knife, which is like you know, <laughs> a stake in the whole stake thing. And Kim, yourself. Oh, um, novels. I, I really like Edward Wayland in Susie McKee Charnas's novel, The Vampire Tapestry. Uh, he's a vampire uh, who's also a history professor um, and he's psychoanalyzed. It's, it's also, I think, a really brilliant novel um and and ought to be on more um lists of, of uh, great vampire books um vampire slayer oh it's robert neville in um uh, richard matheson's i am legend uh who has to count as the ultimate vampire slayer you know uh, literally he's the last one there aren't any other <laughs> um but uh but also I, again i think that's uh a, a remarkable and brilliant novel and the the turnaround in that, which uh, none of the three films adapted from it have managed to do properly, uh, is uh, jaw-droppingly brilliant. Um, awesome. Um, well, you all kind of mentioned reflections and silver, so um, that re leads me nicely into one of my questions. Um, because vampires are reported to have no reflection, they are almost a reflection of ourselves. So there's a theory that we get the vampire we deserve. Lord Byron has been used as a model for a sexy vampire over the years. But who would be the model from today's society? Gareth, let's start with you. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got like, you know, um, sort of rich elite draining us of some like, you know, precious vitality, um, the sort of corrupt influence in our society. I mean, I think like you know, va vampires as the one percent is a very sort of strong interpretation of the myth these days. Awesome, Kim. Um, the thing is, we've had vampires who sort of represent every single segment of society. I do quite like the idea. Uh, I, it, it's a yeah. Um, of vampires actually representing us at our worst. Sadly, there are too many uh, <laughs> notable public examples of us at our worst around at the moment. True. Catch any thoughts? I'd actually, I, I wouldn't have thought it before, but I'd have to agree with Gareth here <laughs> if, of vampires representing like the 1% because it's actually very apt since vampires drain life out of people and the 1% strains money out of people and keeps it for themselves. Brilliant. And this is my political soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got time for a few more questions from our audience. Um, there's one which really does intrigue me. Um, the um, There's been suggestions that Dracula was based on Celtic vampires. So what is the panelists take on that? Kat, we'll start with you since you don't know them. Dracula that well, but you know Celtic. It, it would also help if I knew Celtic vampires and not just Fae. 
<laughs> because most of what I know is Fay. <laughs> Good point. Okay, Gareth. Um, one piece I dug up while researching the Dracula dossier, which I haven't been able to find again since, so I may have hallucinated it, but I'm very fond of it, so I'll stick with it, is uh, one, there was a theory that um, the word Dracula, that Stoker actually took it from Dun Drachfulla, the yeah. Fort of the Bad Blood, which was a perfectly fairy fort in Kerry. Um, and I also found out that Stoker's brother, the cousin George, what's the other, what's the other brother? I mean, one of Stoker's brothers was married to the heir to the McGillicuddy of McGillicuddy's Reeks. So oh, technically yeah. in his brother's backyard. But um, the Dudrick Fulla bit was, it showed up in a lecture given by the head of the Irish Folklore Commission in the 50s but for mysterious reasons, was included in their final folklore report, like sort of final folklore compendium of Irish myth. So clearly suppressed by sinister forces. That is interesting. Yeah, may also be all lies, I can't recall. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, yeah, Stoker's Irishness is one of the really interesting things about him. Um, but he was one of those Irish people who tried to stay as far away from Ireland as possible. Um, he, he changed his mind about home rule at some, at some point in his life. But he was a, he was a Dublin prod, wasn't he? He was an ascendancy, yeah. Yeah, Trinity College kind of, um, yeah. Uh, so I think he might well have wanted to distance himself <laughs> from the, the folkloric side of things. Um, you don't find many, like... He did something really odd in, in Dracula. I mean, all writers do it to some extent, of inscribing his names on, name on characters. So there's an Abraham, Abraham, Abraham Stoker, who's Dutch, and there's a Jonathan Harker, which rhymes with Abraham Stoker, who's English. Um, you can't find Irish people in Dracula, uh, even though That's one true. wrote one. Yeah. That's very true. Um, following on from that... What do we think of the Dracula episode of Buffy? Is that what you is that your um, area? Um, I think that because the Buffy vampires are so different from the Dracula vampires, the only way that it makes sense is if you prescribe to the head headcanon that it was actually a hallucination caused by the monks in order to get Buffy's blood to make it on. Ooh. Oh, that's interesting. And that is the only way that it makes sense, especially because the only two characters on the show that had actually met Dracula did not meet him in the episode. Fantastic. Uh, Kim, thoughts? I saw it. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> I remember it's Rudolph Martin, who also played Dracula in a, a TV movie that same year. Um, I, it was okay. I tell you what, I, I, I thought that the... <laughs> yeah, the appearance of Dracula on the Hardy Boys' Nancy Drew mysteries was more interesting. Or um, John Carradine in McLeod meets Dracula or Dracula on Doctor Who. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I keep track of all, the, all this stuff. The, the Buffy one was kind of okay, but there are, there are more interesting Dracula cameos in, in the oddest um, <laughs> TV shows from, yeah, Gilgan's Island, or The Man from Uncle or whatever. <laughs> And Gareth, any last thoughts from you? Um, I quite like, I, I, I vaguely, it's a lot I recall it. And the Google Gimp was like, Dracula, all these sort of tricks that the Vampires didn't have. And yeah. there in the novel, he's mentioned as studying at the Scholomance, which is this like school of magic in the mountains of Transylvania. So I could sort of see that like, you know, he could be a sort of special vampire. Um, but I, 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 know, I, I really like the master as a Buffy villain and felt he was like sort of, Underused, if they sort of build track it up as a season as opposed to having him as a once off sort of all this yeah. joke bad guy, it could be more interesting. So, yeah, well, I think like once we drag it on, you may as well like use him for good, but as opposed to just come in and go, ah! Excellent. Well, we've had our, we've had our five minute warning. So, um, it just remains for me to um, thank my panelists, um, Kim Newman, Gareth Henderman. And Kat Dodd, it has been a most enjoyable evening chatting with you. Um, don't forget, Octacon will be starting on the 9th, 10th and 11th of October. Um, it will be online. It will be free. 
Uh, we do have a chip jar, um, as Raisa mentioned earlier. Uh, we will hopefully be we will be supporting Jigsaw, um, and we will be having another test taster panel coming up on the first of October. So if you follow our social media pages, there will be more information on that coming up. So once again, thank you very much to my panelists.